do we have a prophetic community or don't we? COVID struck. Why didn't the church know first? That's a good question. It was a global event. Why didn't the church know first? Now there's 400 years that we call the silent years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So the very last scripture of Malachi is the turning of the father's hearts, Pamela, sons, all that thing. can you phone your husband and tell lest him that we can't hear anything? Lest the earth be struck with yeah, a curse? I think they're working on it. Oh, okay. And then the end of the 400 years is John the Baptist. That silence, that 400 years of silence. And what he says is, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I think, because we're going to, well, this is a prophetic meeting, so let's talk prophetically. Let's start this way. Let's take a risk. Let's not necessarily speak presumptuously, but let's take a risk and say, it's good that the storms have come to test our house. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Now we know what kind of house we built. And we have found that the prophetic house ain't so good. Storms came, tested us. Thankfully, by the grace of God, we have a good foundation because we have Christ, but a lot of furniture and walls got removed. <laughs> we walked up to the house at the end of the storm and went, oh, that was a lot of damage done. And John and I started to have the conversation. How can we regroup in the midst of this to build something better? And what was missing in the previous build? A lot of people built alone. A lot of people tried to do their electrical, their plumbing. They tried to build the walls. They were roofers and they shouldn't have been. But now we want to build together because there's specialists in this room. There are electricians. I went away on vacation one time to the Oregon coast and the last thing I said to my wife is do not do any electrical. And my daughter sends me a picture of my wife pulling down a ceiling and doing electrical. And I said to her, please, what was the last thing I said? She says to me, did I say to you I wasn't going? I said, you didn't say that. So it was just a request and I just didn't obey. I, I'm going to do electrical and thank the Lord she didn't burn down the house and the power worked. But it scared me because she's not an electrician, but she has YouTube, so that worked too. <laughs> she also fixed our dryer, which was really weird for me. <laughs> Second Chronicles 2020, you can see the verse. No, wait, well, we did. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. That's that firm foundation that we talked about, something that is built on the rock, that when the storm comes, the foundation remains. We have, because we have Christ. Believe in his prophets, and you shall prosper. We want prosper. So the definition of established is to, to support, to be firm, to be faithful, to trust, to be permanent, to be true and to be certain. And we have that. Now the definition of prosper, staring at that verse, believe his prophets and you shall prosper. To push forward, to break out, to come mightily, to go over, to be profitable. I think we can quickly agree <laughs> We want that. And if we don't have a strong prophetic ministry, if we don't have a strong prophetic voice, we will not push forward, break out, go mightily, go over. It's part of what is required in the church for its growth. In Alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous, the first thing they say in order to make a change, they say, first step, admit you have a problem. So we can't just push aside the problems of the past and just move on with something, just doing what we did before. First thing, let's admit we have a problem. The prophetic hasn't been what it appears, according to this scripture, that it can be. The other thing we need, if we're gonna speak prophetically for a moment, 
is that Sons of Issachar business. Sons of Issachar and Chronicles. It says that what they could do is they could look at the signs of the times and then decide what Israel should do. Boy, we need that, hey? Like during this last COVID thing that we just went through, did we need the sons of Issachar? Hello. We needed those people. Now, there was only 200 in, in David's army that were sons of Issachar. Only 200 of those people. It was a, a fairly select group when you're talking about 3,000 from this group, 3,000 from that. But they, they, they had the wisdom of the Lord. It's not that they were prophets, but they were discerners. They just looked. And th through godly wisdom, they, could, they were able to make a decision and then tell the rest of the, we'll just move this through the cross to us now. They could just then say, look at the situation that we're in. 200 counsel together. And then they say, what should the church do? How should the church respond? If we had an Issachar ministry today, COVID would have not divided us. There would be outliers for sure. There always is. And we're okay with that. There is the official opposition in government and there can be the official opposition in the church. We want to have an open discussion. But what if that Issachar spirit was in us, in the church and recognized? But that's also what I was talking about at the beginning is community. That can only be through community. That's not the voice of one man or one woman. That's a community that comes together and makes a decision. We just heard, I think it was Mike Bickle who uses the phrase that we, we are equals with a head. We are equals with a head. Equals with a leader. We are all equals. I will esteem each one as better than myself. But at some point, somebody has to make a decision. So we're equals. So everyone, uh, there is a link in the chat. If you look there, there's a YouTube link where you can uh, listen in uh, to the live stream uh, for now. And then we can hop back over to Zoom uh, for breakouts later. With a head. Equals with a head. So it seems like prophets and prophetic people are a good thing to have around. They're going to help us in the breakthrough. They're not the only ones. Ephesians 4 says we have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints. Now, what's interesting is that word equipping actually means to furnish something. It's like furnishing a house. It's furnishing. So it's putting into the, this house that we were talking about that was built on the rock. It's furnishing it. It's decorating it. It's putting in all that is required. And there's been many moves. John and I saw this back in the 80s where there was this idea that the prof the apos or sorry the fivefold ministry as it's been called many groups tried to get together to form those communities but as we and I'm just going to say this quick but what those things weren't built on was love they were built on gift and the entire book of 1 Corinthians which we don't have time to go through obviously if you just look at the book of Corinthians and its whole context, the whole point that it was addressing there is to build this community, to edify this community, to strengthen this community, to have a family. Love is the requirement first. There is a powerful scripture. Being a prophetic person, the most terrifying scripture in, in the Bible to me is Though I have the gift of prophecy and can speak all mysteries and all knowledge, but have not love, I am nothing. I am, it says. Not you've done nothing. Not you've, you haven't accomplished anything. I am. I'm nothing. My motive had better be from a Pure, purer heart. I'm not going to say pure, that's too high, <laughs> but I want to press to purer. I'm going to go really quick through this, and then if there's questions sometimes in the future, we can talk about it. First of all, what is a prophet? The 
pure definition is one who delivers divine messages or interprets the divine will. One who delivers divine messages or interprets the divine will. What does it mean to prophesy? It means to utter or foretell with divine inspiration. That is to prophesy. To utter or foretell with divine inspiration. And the divine inspiration part is the key. How do we know when a prophet or a prophetic person is not receiving divine messages by divine inspiration and not interpreting the divine will? We don't even have to guess at that. That's not open for discussion. Deuteronomy 18, 21 and 22. Did I give you that scripture? Deuteronomy 18, 21 and 22. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? That asks the question. And then it answers this for us. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet, it says, has spoken, spoken, presumptuously. He presumed. And then it says, you shall not be afraid of him. So if he comes to you with a word of rebuke or whatever it happens to be, you can just go, no. No, I can't. I'm sorry. It's pretty simple. So what do we do? This is too big of a, this is too big of a thing. But what do we do when a person that we know is a prophet, we know because of a previous track record of good stuff, what do we do with that person? Longer discussion. Because that's a very real thing. There's people in this last time period with COVID and the Trump, that profound prophets that I would listen to any day of the week, I'd happily sit under their ministry and they got it wrong. But there's also the clue here is they spoke presumptuously. So what is a prophet? It's, he's not speaking his will. He's speaking a divine will. So somehow, if I speak incorrectly and say that it is the word of the Lord, what scripture is saying is I assumed something. I presumed out of my own opinion. I didn't hear him first. One of the ways that, I, one of the ways that prophecy over the years for me has so blessed me is because I almost always know when it is completely the word of the Lord because it's not ever what I would have thought. I go, really? That's what you think? That's what you want me to tell? Well, I'm going to have to change my opinion now. Because I'm carried by the Spirit. And He changes my mind. And I go, then I go, oh shoot, I never thought that was real. I, I, didn't, think he, I didn't think he'd do that. Okay. Now I have, to, I have to switch. When, it, when, when he behaves exactly the way I thought he would, I'm probably wrong. <laughs> because his ways are higher than mine. Where is prophecy primarily to be uttered? Primarily. There's exceptions. We talked about that before. John talked about. 1 Corinthians 14.4. I think we have the scripture. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Almost exclusively, the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Therefore, tongues are a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. It is primarily, and there are always exceptions, <laughs> it is primarily to happen here. Why? Back to what we said before. Because its purpose is to build us. It's for this house. It's for the body. It's for the church. It's building on that solid foundation. It's furnishing us. That's the specific purpose. What is the express and stated purpose of the prophetic person's divine utterance? 1 Corinthians 14, 3, 
But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. That's not all it does. That's just because Paul is addressing this particular group of people over a specific problem. But within the church, that's its strength for us. So what is edification? Big word. You can do it this way. Edification is to build up. Exhortation is to stir up. Comfort is to cheer up. So edification is to build up morally, emotionally, and spiritually. That's, just think of that house picture. What is that to do? It's to build that house. Stir up, exhortation. It is to strongly encourage. The word encourage just simply means give courage. Give courage. Just build your faith. I had a lady come to me decades ago, and she says, oh, it's going to be hard to tell the story. Ah, the emotions come back. I had this lady came to me years ago, and she says, I want to speak in tongues. There was a whole line of people who wanted to. But she says, I want to speak in tongues. And so I, can I move? Am I allowed to move? Can I go this way in the camera? Okay. So she was sitting like here, and I walked over and I heard the Holy Spirit to me, say to me, tell her to stand up. <laughs> so <laughs> she just kind of looks around everybody. <laughs> and so she stands up and the Holy Spirit said through me, you stand believing. And I saw her change. It was like faith fell in. It was the weirdest thing. It's never happened since to me. You know, sometimes you want to recreate it because it was such a good moment, never works. So she said, and I says, you stand believing. And she looks at me, her eyes, she just starts to bawl. And she says, I believe. And I said, speak. And she goes, just like that. Like she'd been doing it a hundred years. So live stream is working fine. Just bam. And I went, oh, if ministry was always this easy, right? Strongly encourage. Give courage to. That's what prophetic ministry is for. Comfort is to cheer up in times of distress. Just so simple. I gave up. This lady came down. It's my favorite prophetic story. This lady comes to me. I didn't know her. Her and her husband. She comes to me, and I'm sitting there. And she says, you know, I need prayer ministry. And I, I'm looking, and I'm like, a phrase comes to my mind. One phrase. Weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Do you know that? You know what a weeble is? It's that little man that's weighted on the bottom. Little men and women, it's a family group. <laughs> that has a little weight on the bottom, and you push it over, and it won't fall down. It always goes back up. So I said, weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. And I'm like, oh, Lord, this is the end of my ministry. This is the end. So, and she says to me, I says, do you know what a weeble is? She says, no. And I'm like, this is horrible. Because usually he gives something that people can tie themselves to, like an anchor. So I had to describe what a weeble was, which is from the 80s, 70s probably, these little things. So and she says, she looks at me like, you got anything else? Like, <laughs> and so I'm like, you know, uh, I got weebles, well, but they don't fall down. A year later, she comes back to me, big smile on her face. She said, I got something I want to tell you. Do you remember? <laughs> do you remember Weeples Wobble, but they don't fall down? I says, you know, like horribly. Like, it wasn't a good experience for me. I'm like, yeah, I remember Weeples Wobble, but they don't fall down. She said, a few months after you gave me that word, I fell into clinical depression. And I have medicated and suffered depression for like almost a year. And the whole time, that phrase, weeples wobble, but they don't fall down. Weeples wobble, but they don't fall down. And she says, I'm out. I'm off my medication. I'm clean. It doesn't have to be complicated. <laughs> I have told that story, I mean, ask my wife, 
from Guatemala to Finland. Everywhere we go, I think I tell that story. Just how uncomplicated it is, but the anchor that he can give in just a simple little word. Comfort, cheer up. It literally cheered her up. The woman was in depression. Literally cheered her up. That's, that's powerful to me. It was so good. Um, how much time do I have, John? We just have a bit of a schedule, so we want to make sure that we get everybody in. What's that? Um, I could, I could, I could do another. I mean, a while, but I could do another st one story. Five minutes. Yeah. Um, one of the things I just, I really want to. Um, at the beginning, I spoke about that we need to learn to do this as a family. We need to do learn to do this better as a family. We need to be tied to one another. And it's not just about accountability. It's not, it's not just like a, an anchor that hangs off you, so oh, I have to talk to so and so forth. It's not all that because we are then mutually encouraged. We get the blessing. The story of the weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. Did it bless anybody here, even though it was only for one person? Yeah. Amen. You got to hear it. And I, I want to tell this story because it involves this house. I want to show you how powerful mutual submission and a shared word can be. A shared word. So it builds us all up. It builds us all up. I had a, I'll have to go through this quick. I had a prophetic word that I held in me for 15 years. Okay? So the Lord said to me, I want you to go prophesy to this church, but not now. I'll tell you when. Like to the whole church. And I said, like the Nineveh prophet, I will never go to that church. I am never going to that church. Guaranteed. So over the years, every once in a while I would have to be in that church. For, uh, they, they would hold grad ceremonies and different things because it was a larger church. So, and I would go in there and I'm like so thankful that it wasn't a service or there was no pastors there or anything because I didn't want to give the word. Now, here's the other thing, is I didn't know what the word was going to be. The Lord never told me what he wanted me to tell them. All he said is, one day you will prophesy in this church to the leaders. So, I didn't even know what it was going to be. And I thought right away, it's going to be judgment. I presumed, presumptuous, I presumed that's what it was going to be. So, I'm not going, not going to Nineveh. Mm. So every time I would go to that church and my wife would be with me and she'd be like, you know, you feeling anything? Like, you're, don't harass me. Do not. <laughs> so she mentions it to me. 15 years later, we're out somewhere and she says, have you thought, I got to be really careful not to say the name of the church. Have you thought any more about that thing? And I, no, no, I haven't really thought about it. It's been 15 years. But it was held there. And so I went upstairs, I sat by my desk, and I kind of crossed my mind and I thought, hmm, something stirred in me when she said, have you thought about it lately? I'm like, yeah, you know, I am Nineveh. I'm trying to stay away from Nineveh. So I just sat down at my desk and I said, Lord, is now the time. I just slipped off my chair. I went to my knees beside my desk and instantly he gave me the whole word front to back, word for word, and a vision to go along with it. Now I'm like, now I'm stuck. Like, no, I have to go. I went to that church on a Sunday morning, and my fear was he's going to make me, oh, I better back up. Yeah, I better back up. So I get this word. The first thing I did was contact Ken Greta. And I said, Ken, this is what I think the word of the Lord is saying to me about this church. I told him what it was, what do you think? 
Ken looked it over, said, that's the word of the Lord. I said, so can you be my protection? Can I put your name on the word like my name is going to be on the word? Can I give your phone number like my phone number is going to be on the word? Can we basically partner in this word? And he's like, oh yeah, he's in. That's brave. That's super brave. So I go to the church. The short version of the story is I give the word to the pastor. I have to speed this up. I give the word to the pastor in a service, not out loud like I feared in front of everybody. He had a, he, at the end of the service, he called and said, is there anybody in the service who has a word for the church? Feel free to come forward. <laughs> they have never done that. <laughs> so I snuck up to him and I says, I have a word for you. And he says, yeah, absolutely. I give him the word. He's doing this. He says, can you write it all out? I can, because he, the Lord gave it to me in that form. I can write it all out, the whole thing. He keeps it. He keeps that word. This is three years ago. He keeps that word in his Bible, praying and waiting for the fulfillment. He took that word. It gets better. He then takes that word to his elders. What do you think about this? All the elders, that's the word of the Lord. And they wanted to do something right away. Some of the elders were like, get the horses out of the barn. We're going. Like, they wanted to do something. Anyway, then the stat pastor takes it to the Abbotsford Ministerial Association, where Ken happens to be, and reads it in front of all the pastors there. And they're like, that's the word of the Lord. But Ken says to me, it wasn't the word that impressed them. They stopped this pastor and said, you're telling me he got permission before he gave you that word? You're telling me he sought out an authority to be over top of him before he gave you that word? You're telling me he signed his name? <laughs> you know, gave a phone number so that he's held accountable for that word? They were like, that don't happen in my church. That's the difference that that one single word can build community instead of it just being, you know, kind of separated, kind of off to one side, right? It goes from me to Ken, to the elders, to the ministerial, to all of Abbotsford. Any church that was sitting in that room gets to hear it. Powerful. So you have, in, in Ken and Mike, you have good leaders here. <laughs> willing to take a chance on a doofus like me. They took a chance. And uh, it changes lives. That kind of pro prophetic ministry. That's what we want to, that's what we hope, that the, not this church, that we all become. That we all live in a prophetic ministry that looks like that. More power to it. It'll build us, it'll edify us, it'll comfort us, and we get the mutual benefit one of another. Stay here, stay here, sir. So, um, isn't this good? So I want to ask you a question. Did you always, did you always think that way? Like, I'm going to submit it to the pastor and I'm going to be corporate? Um, there was many times, like when I, when I, like when I, when I came to faith, I was, like the first thing I did was prophesy. Like that was it. So it's been my whole life. And it was a little scattergun in the beginning. I'm going to be honest. But then I had a pastor that immediately said to me, basically, will you submit under my authority? And so 15 years, we walked together. So if I, if I literally, if I gave, because I would do like prophetic meetings, so it would be like, you know, that thing, a bunch of people and everybody wants a word. And then I would, call, when the meeting was over, I would call him that night and say, I prophesied over this person and this is what I said. I prophesied over this person, this is what I said. I prophesied over this person, this is what I said. And he, for years, took all my flack. I thought everybody loved me. And they didn't. He got all kinds of complaints. <laughs> but he covered me because wow. he loved me. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Brad. Um, 
you know, this is, this is really deep and this is really important. Um, at every level God will promote you will have to do with your accountability to others. I mean, we're just, we're just talking about personal prophecy, basically, although Brad had something for a church. What about prophetic words for nations? How do we handle those levels of accountability? Because those levels are other levels of relationship that if you're going to uh, be accountable in the little things, God will give you more. Isn't that biblical? Is that scriptural, Pastor Ken? Faithful in the little, he'll give more. Or he'll give much. And so, uh, did I share about James Maloney when he prayed over me uh, here? Have I shared that here? When I was in Bible college and James Maloney, do you guys remember? Now, what, what, uh, let, me, let me repeat it real quick. Because we want to bring Tinny on to share some things. But I want to touch on a couple things. When I was in Bible college, and I really liked James Maloney and some of the prophets who would come through, but, you know, I was, I was sitting back here in Bible college, you know, in the back of the, of the school, and James Maloney gets up to speak, and I says, I want something of the mantle that's on him. And the Lord says to me, you know, as your faith is, so be it to you. So I'm sitting in the back, and all I kept saying was, Lord, I want to thank you that I'm going to receive something tonight. I just said, I thank you, I'm going to receive something. And that's when, you know, 20 minutes later, James Maloney says, you, you in the back, get up here right now. God's going to impart something to you. And so I run up and I'm standing beside him. And what was on him, just that prophetic mantle fell on me. And the lady he was praying for, I just saw so clear. And my whole life began to change. Problem was, I had an independent spirit. I thought I was the prophet of power for the hour. And, you know, my, my spiritual parents knew that and they kept trying to pull me into the covering and the truth is at times I resisted it because I didn't understand divine order but what God was after in me wasn't just the character he wanted to impart to me something that they had as a family that our, my spiritual moms and dads had and so they were they would they would go after me at times for the independence for that part of my being that wasn't corporate like Brad just said you know Somebody comes and says, can I cover you? Yeah, maybe. That was me. Because my gift was so strong. But I actually became deceived a few times in my gift. Because I didn't have the accountability of others to test the word at times. And I literally, in the early years, went off a few times. Now... Let me read a scripture, a couple of scriptures to you in 1 Corinthians 12 and uh, 1. You got those scriptures? Do you want me just to read it? 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 1. My fellow believers, I don't want you to be confused about spiritual realities or gifts. Now, the Greek context here is to be uninformed. We're trying to bring uh, some understanding about gifts, about the love of the Father, and about unity for this family to grow. But listen, listen to this in the uninformed part. It says, to be ignorant of. And sometimes it says, with the ideal of willful ignorance. So someone comes along and says, you know, God's speaking about unity. Yeah, but, you know, we become willful a little bit in our ignorance and we say, yeah, okay, but. And it's okay to have questions, but not, not out of a, a willful, I just don't want that for me. You know, that's not for me. And so what the Holy Spirit began to do with me was hold me accountable more for my words and make me more corporate under the covering of my family. Right? Where you begin to feel and see something prophetically, corporately, in a company of prophets, in a company of people, and that's why Brad was touching on the sons of Issachar. 200, you know, people discerning. Last fall, uh, I, I personally liked Donald Trump. Personally. I, 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 thought, I thought he's going to win the election. I did. And so for a week, I'm thinking to myself, oh, Donald Trump's going to win. But something in my spirit was unsettled. 
I didn't have a peace. I didn't have a rest. I, I said, God, there's something wrong. I'm discerning something, but it doesn't feel right. So I stopped listening to all media, the news. I cut it all off. I completely stopped listening because something didn't feel right. I wasn't at rest in what I felt I was prophetically discerning. After five days, I feel the Holy Spirit capture my heart to a place near him. And in that place was perfect peace, love, joy. And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, Joe Biden needs salvation. And I could feel the Father's heart go to that man and I instantly knew Donald Trump wasn't gonna win the election. And the Lord began to speak to me and said, the, the prophets are off. Uh, I'm gonna say it again, the prophets are off. If they were right, they would have said something like, Donald Trump is gonna win, but it'll be, you know, they would have prophesied differently. Is God confused? No, he's not confused. He would have prophesied differently. Don't you think that's true? I do. He's not confused. What's my point? As I began to realize what is going on prophetically, even in America that time, was the prophets were individually often prophesying something, and I wasn't aware of the depths of accountability. Maybe there was some, but it wasn't as deep as perhaps was needed to discern the heart of the Lord. You know, Jeremiah Johnson blessed me so much. He was one of the young prophets that said, Father, I was wrong. And you know what he said in his, he, I watched two podcasts of him. And one of the podcasts, he said, I have now surrounded myself with spiritual parents and mature men and women that I'm going to be accountable to. I thought, wow, good on you, Jeremiah Johnson, for stepping into a realm of understanding of what we're talking about in the corporate. The accountability side, where now we can be accountable to one another differently. And I'm looking forward to what's coming next. We'll have different types of circles and accountability prophetically. I didn't even plan to say that, but I believe the Holy Spirit wanted me to. Because I was standing back there and he said, tell your story of Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Can we be accountable for our words? Can we allow the Holy Spirit to make us so corporate that when we discern, he will entrust us with deep things of his heart? We're on a journey together. And this church is called as an apostolic center. We know that. But it's going to have a, a context of a, of a corporate expression also within wheels of relationships outside this family in accountability and accountability and accountability. So God is refining the church that when we say something, it's clear, it's pure. And like Brad said, it will come to pass. Amen? So I want to encourage the younger generation in the house. Find the moms and dads. Find those ones that you can be close to. Not, uh, one another's fine, no problem. But you need uh, some other more mature ones around you. So let's not be uninformed or ignorant of what God is saying. He's after us for some deep places. Um, Tinny, are you, are you available? Is Tinny, uh, what time is it? 10 to 8. Are we able to yes. hear, hear Tinny? Do you hear me okay? Yeah. Are we going to see her oh, on great. the screen, Michael? Uh, yeah. So, Tinny, what, are you going to share the, uh, how we grow? Here's Tinny. Yeah. Come on. Do we need to turn around, Michael, to see her here? Okay. Hmm. All right, is everyone able to hear right, me and Tini, see me okay? Everyone able to, great? Okay, hello everyone. <laughs> Thank you for being patient uh, through the audio. I uh, hope you were able to catch, I was able to catch uh, a big part of the latter portion, but um, I think everything uh, that John was sharing was spot on to what I was, uh, well, 
what I'm planning to share a bit. So I'll just share briefly about um, uh, something that the Lord has been speaking to to us uh, corporately about the way how we activate and retain uh, the the words that is spoken over us, and um, uh, it's and it's a something called a learning triangle, and this is something that's used in education. Um, let me just share screen. I don't know if you would be able to see if I share my screen here. Um, okay, are you guys able to see the triangle? Great. Yes, Tinny, we can see it. Awesome. Okay. So yeah, I think so good what you shared, John. Um, just uh, it was a very is a very good uh, prelude to what I'm sharing here. Um, so what we were we've been kind of lev- uh, using to apply to a walk is this learning triangle, and it applies to um, general learning, but actually just the words we receive from the Lord. And this started out uh, uh, based on a sermon that we were feeling on the parable of uh, of the sower or the parable of the soil. And um, so Jesse from our church was sharing on that. And so if you look at this triangle, this is the triangle of retention. So if you just listen to a lecture, you're pretty much retaining 5%. If you're reading it, reading something, you're retaining 10%. If uh, you're listening or seeing something, audio visual is 20%. And uh, if something is being demonstrated to you, you retain 30%. Um, and then as you start to engage in discussion, uh, you retain 50%. So you can see it, it goes up exp- uh, by a lot. And um, as you practice doing it, uh, you retain 75%. And as you teach others, uh, you you learn to retain 90% of that. Um, so uh, how is this applicable to, to uh, what, we, what we've been learning is actually the Lord was speaking to me about uh, a verse just after the parable of, um, of, of the sower. And this is in Matthew 13, 14. And um, it's interesting that John was mentioning about the willful ignorance and it's um, if you if you ever remember hearing a lot of sermons or or even taking notes, right? And that's really I was totally convicted when I read this verse after the parable of the sower. It talks about it says in Matthew thirteen fourteen it says you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing but never perceiving. So this is what happens when we hover around. Read, maybe just reading the Bible or listening to sermon or seeing someone preach or even have it demonstrated to us. And if we stay in that um, in that area, we are actually um, receiving words very passively. And your retention is almost as if you're really not really understanding it because at 20%, at 10%, 5%, you're not retaining that much. And you'll be ever, you can be seeing and hearing all these things, but you, you'll never be perceiving. And so um, so the difference is, so the next verse says, for this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. So I was deeply convicted because if I'm listening to sermons, I'm attending church every Sunday, um, even if I tune into online sermons, putting, um, receiving all these words or receiving prophetic words, if my heart is not right, or if my heart is not the good soil, it is callous. And callous basically means you're hovering in the passive, hard heart. Passive means you're not. Uh, it's not an active heart. They, so you end up being stuck. You don't. You're not activated in the words that you're receiving. And so, but when you actually step into a discussion, which you cannot. Probably it's probably hard, pretty hard to carry on a discussion with yourself. So as as soon as you step into discussion, you're involving a third party. You're involving um, a, 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 another person, which brings in accountability. And that's what um, John was sharing about: is if there's accountability to test, that brings a safety. And as soon as you bring a a, a third party in, when you when you receive a word, and like I think what Brad was sharing too, uh, there was the the, the person who received the word and he went to the elders. Uh, he didn't just take the word 
and just assume that it will it would happen. He was stewarding the word by involving um, an, an elder and a covering in order to um, hold the word and discern the word together. And, um, and so, uh, so that takes you into being active. And so we're really feeling that even with, uh, it, with the prophetic, with the rooms that we, we, we run usually, and even when we run it at church, we always try to uh, prophesy and minister in pairs at least. So there's accountability um, and we all, we know and we hear and we prophesy in part. So that's the beauty of operating in teams because as one person shares something, um, the other person uh, complements with what they're seeing. Um, so feeling like the in, in prophecy, there's a huge component of corporate, uh, corporation, cooperation. And, and also, um, I think as a part of this verse as well, um, you can see, oh, sorry, this one. Yeah, as, so when we're listening to, to a sermon or reading things or hearing a sermon or even just seeing it demonstrated, we're really just hovering around an individual experience. But as, we, as soon as we engage in, uh, in allowing others to be involved, then it becomes a corporate experience. And as you teach other and impart and so that becomes a corporate. And that's where you exponentiate the, the effectiveness of the word being sown into your life. And um, so just uh, just a step back to the to the verse. And this the so Jesus was actually responding to the disciples' question of why he uh, he speaks speak to them in parables is because Jesus actually wants um, participation. And that's also what uh, I, I believe what prophecy is also about. I think the, the idea of prophesying and receiving a prophetic word is not just so that you know what's going to happen. It's you receive a word, but the word is usually kind of a part. It requires your, uh, it, it's an invitation to participate with the word of God in order to uh, activate it. And so as we cooperate and in teams to impart words, there's a invitation for the person who's being ministered to, to, to participate. And so there's a stewardship that is uh, required of them. Um, just like when Jesus speaks in parables, there's, um, there's a level of involvement uh, from the other side in order to, um, participate with him and for for the for the understanding of that word um so i think this is okay yeah so that's just a little bit of a back background or, or visual picture of uh what we are already walking in and trying to uh, practice and um so uh, john would it be a good time to take a break now um just I'm or just going to give a quick exhortation to go with that, Tinny. Great. And, and then we will, um, on, online we have teams. We have 20 or so from our church and some others are going to do breakout rooms and pray for people. And then we're going to have some prophetic prayer here. But I want to read a scripture to you and I want to, you know, just ask the Lord to enlarge your heart as we keep talking about the corporate. When I go into a team or any teams, one thing the Lord started to do with me is bring me out of individual thinking to feel what he wants to do corporately. Let me read this scripture to you. Can you guys bring this up? Um, 1 Corinthians 14, 29 and 33 on the Passion Translation. And this is what we want to emphasize tonight because as we get ready for prayer, let's ask the Holy Spirit that we can feel what he's doing together, even in small groups. And it says this, the same with prophecy, 1 Corinthians 14, 29 and 33 in the Passion Translation, the same with prophecy, let two or three prophets prophesy, let the other prophets carefully evaluate and discern what's being said. If someone receives a revelation while someone else is still speaking, the one speaking should conclude and allow the fresh revelation the opportunity to share it. 
Did you get that? So somebody's prophesying and their heart discerns that someone here has a fresh revelation. You, you learn to step back and let the flow happen corporately. Let me read it one more time. If someone receives a revelation while someone else is still speaking, the one speaking should conclude and allow the one with fresh revelation the opportunity to share it. For all can prophesy and turn in an environment where all present can be instructed, encouraged, and strengthened. So as we get ready for breakout rooms and for small groups tonight, ask the Holy Spirit that you can feel together what he wants to do. Tinny, do you want to add something about the, the, the uh, breakout rooms? Uh, yes. So if anyone else is joining on live stream right now, uh, we would encourage you to hop on over to the Zoom link so that we can place you in a breakout room. Uh, so it looks like we have about... Um, we have enough. We have enough people to to run uh, run the rooms. So if more people join, we should be able to host it. So maybe I would set it for a, a, a longer time, or fifteen to twenty minutes. 15 That's minutes? fine. Sure. Okay. Do you have any instructions? Uh, do you want to give the breakout rooms separate from from us here? Uh, yes. So you would receive an invitation to join the breakout room. So just click accept. Um, I will help with the. Uh, timing. So everyone who is praying, please be mindful of the messages that pop up, or you can just keep uh, keep time. I think maybe we'll start with 15 minutes, and I'll send you a, um, a two-minute notice. Then you can be mindful, and I will be sending that. So just stay, in, uh, the people who are ministering, just stay in the room. Uh, but when you're done with the person, uh, you can exit by clicking leave breakout room. Thank you, Tinny. Yeah. So Pastor Ken and Mike, uh, we're going to take a few minute break here. And then do you want to help us uh, structure some teams here on site with your leadership and some of us? And then who, who wants prayer? Pastor Ken's okay. Let's take a five minute break, okay? Okay.
Come on back, everybody. Come on back. Ken, how are we doing? We're going to have some, some for prayer? You got, you got, do you know who wants prayer? Oh, the, that are going to team up? With some of us? Okay, come on back, you guys. Come on, come on back, come on back. Braden, no peas. No peas. <laughs> do you? Oh, God had nothing to do with peas. <laughs> come on, come on back, uh, everybody. Tini, are you starting the breakout rooms there? You got them going? Um, maybe just another couple minutes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, Justin. Come on, we need you over here, Justin. Come on. Yeah, there is. There is one. We can share. Just, just before. Uh, just before we uh, start with some with some prayer time, could you guys take your seat over here, Justin? Come and sit down. I know it's hot. Uh, we won't. I know it's hot, but I just um, I just want we want to take just a few minutes. Hi, Nershan. Isn't he a good man, Nershan? Did you tell him you love him today? Yeah. <laughs> Did he tell you? <laughs> okay uh look, can we can we focus up here ladies just we, for a few minutes we just want to take a few minutes are there any questions before we go to prayer are there any questions that we we may be able to answer or or not but uh, uh, justin go okay um brad yeah brad um you were telling the story about the prophetic word uh that you went to ken with for the approval he gave the phone number and his name on it and etc what what was the word you know i i don't think you said what the word was no i didn't uh what was the word okay in brief in brief because it was uh it was isaiah it was quite big so, um, in brief, my fear, let, let me start with this. My fear was that it was going to be judgment, like I said. So that's why I didn't want to do it, right? And I have all these rules about prophecy, far more than the Bible has, about how I will deliver. Part of it's insecurity, right? That's my flesh. And part of it, I think the Lord was trying to establish something in me, right? A covering. Now, what was strange is the first thing he said to me when I went to my knees is he said, you have a little strength. That phrase, that was it. You have a little strength. That was part of the word. So I went, you have a little strength. You have a little strength. And so I went, I know that from somewhere. That's somewhere in the Bible. Does anybody know where that is? You have a little strength. It's actually the, one of the letters to the Church of Philadelphia. So it was actually a letter to a church. <laughs> so I go to, I look it up. You have a little strength, letter to the Church of Philadelphia. Oh, this seems pretty real. This seems like a good thing. So it was built around, you have a little strength. Um, and interestingly, my fear about being, it being a judging word is Philadelphia is one of the only two churches that was not corrected in the book of Revelation. So he, he completely allayed all my fears. It was, if I would have presumed, like I talked about, if I would have presumed, I would have completely missed it. But I just let him be the spirit to fill the sail to carry me. I let him carry me the whole way. And he developed it as I just sat there on my knees. 
Um, it was, you have a little strength. And there was like a, but now's the time, I'll do a short, now's the time to attach yourself as a body to the rest of the body. And he actually gave me a time period when that happened. In the word, he said to me, 15 years ago, this happened, which I had no idea. And that was the confirming word for the pastor. As I said, 15 years ago is when, and he went, oh, I know exactly. I know exactly what happened on that day. So that was a confirming word. And so that's what it was. In essence, it was longer, but that's your... Okay, thanks. Uh, I got a question with regards to basically um, putting putting blanket rules. I understand when people are growing in prophecy and they're starting out and we have the, you know, no dates, no marriages, you know, no babies, stay away from these things, right? I don't know if you guys know the three things to stay away from, obviously, right? Um, and I've even heard no correction. So I just want to, in my question, I have an example. One time uh, there was this kid that I never knew that came around uh, down in Texas, came over for about a few weeks. He was just staying with us. And I had such a heart for him. I'm like, man, I can see that he's bound up in chains. And he says he's a Christian. He's around. He's going through the motions, but he's not really there. And so I just kept giving him one prophetic word after another until I got alone with him. And it was a perfect time. And I had this unction to give him a word of correction. And it was really strong. Um, and it was the word that set him free. And I, I didn't even know this, but I guess at the time they were saying no words of correction. And this was in summer now. And, and I, I gave this word and it set him free. And he actually asked me the question. He said, Braden, that word changed my life because it gave me the gift of repentance. But if you would have followed to a T what they were saying, I'm like, oh, I didn't know. I probably wouldn't have gave the word if I knew. What do you do about blanket rules? Like never give a prophetic word with correction. Okay. Uh, never give a prophetic word. Okay. You know? I don't have a, because I don't think it's biblical. I don't have a no word of correction rule. I don't think that's, I don't think you can do that biblical narrative. I don't know how, I don't know how. One of the things that, like I said, is people often look at 1 Corinthians and they pull a verse here and there. So prophecy is edification, exhortation, and comfort. That's what it says. So then they say, no words of correction. That's not what 1 Corinthians is saying at all. It's addressing a specific problem in that church in that day. That is not, 1 Corinthians is not everything that is to be said about prophecy. It's some of the stuff that's to be said about prophecy. We have to look at the totality of scripture, Genesis to Revelation, to know what it says. And I just had a situation in a church where I was in a prophetic class and they went up and they were teaching out of a manual and it was no correction. And I went to the leadership and said, chapter verse me. And they went, okay, we're changing that. <laughs> because it is a common teaching. So they adjusted it for their next class. But I don't have a no. And again, we, we talked in the beginning about, uh, I, I, think, I think, Braden, that the danger in a generation past where prophets were quite harsh. And there was such a lack of love at time. I mean, I got prophetic words as a young believer that tore me to shreds in correction. And I, I'll, maybe I'll share those over lunch tomorrow, some of them. And so I think what the Holy Spirit was doing is trying to bring a balance to, like Proverbs, just weights and balance, you know? So it's not just like this, and it's not just like this. He, he, he brings a wisdom to the church and a balance. But as we shared in the, in the first session, I mean, I've had lots of one-on-one -on -one encounters. But God stopped that for seasons of my life until it was more pure. And also what we're talking about, Braden, the reason we're talking about accountability is there's other realms of growth that we want to be accountable for what we say. Especially you start prophesying over the nation, you know? And you start, you know what I mean? Now I have a word for the city. Now I have a word for the nation. What if it doesn't come to pass? What are you going to do with that? You know, that's where the heart gets more tested. And so we're talking about layers of things. We're trying to impart accountability but we're not trying to control the Holy Spirit because he will bring words of correction and he will give us encounters and we will have encounters in the 7-Eleven. But we're also trying to help with the growth of the family 
where young people in their gift can often be very immature, that they could actually grow in the context of what Corinthians also says, let the prophets, other prophets judge. So that now we're in two realms of we want to grow differently together. We want to grow up into him as a team, right? So there, there's a lot of more things we could talk about in times to come. We actually talked about maybe this fall doing advanced prophetic school, talking about other things, but we're just scratching the surface of some of it. Check, check. Oh, it's working now. I totally understand that, like, it's not always a healthy culture to walk up to somebody and say, hey, God told me you're my husband or you're my wife. I get that. Uh, and we actually experienced the LCU. That was happening quite often, like probably five, six, seven times where they had to corporately correct that. And then where, I, where, where it got tricky for me, I'm like, God, oh, uh, there was one guy who was very introverted and it was totally out of his character, but it was God. And he didn't follow the rule. He went up to this girl and he said, hey, he said, I feel that we're supposed to go on a date. I feel like you're the one. And he was so out of his character. And she got mad. She was actually on staff, walked away like, how dare that guy to come up to me? And the Lord challenged her and said, you prayed three days ago for a guy to come up to you because you're too nervous to approach anyone. And I sent him. They started courting. Leadership got involved. And they actually got married and they blessed it. Totally a one-off. And I get that. But that's, if he would have followed the blanket rule, they might not have been married. And I was like, what do I do with this? Because as a whole rule, it's such a good rule. Like, because it could be control, manipulation. Hey, God told me you got to obey God. Gets really weird. So that was one area where I'm like, man, I've always wrestled with that prophetic. This guy kind of stepped, it was like a, a one-off. I don't know if you have any wisdom on that. I, I don't have any. What were the three things you said? No babies, no weddings? Uh, no babies, no, no marriages, and no dates. Like, in this four months, this is what's going to happen. I, again, you're, you're going to have to chat perverse me on it. Yeah. Uh, because I don't have that rule because Scripture doesn't. However. Yeah. Right? If, if the Lord said to me, I want you to go tell him or her... Uh, the marriage thing, I, that would be tough. That would be the Nineveh moment for me too. I'd probably run the other way. But if he said something to me, what we're trying to say is, I go to Ken. I don't go to you, who I think is the word. I don't go to you, because I think, I go to Ken. Ken, Mike. But this is what, can we together? And they go, Oh, wow. Does this feel, let's, does this feel right? Hey, we're not sure. Let's go to the elders. Let's in, give a group of people. Let's, let's take the steps so that we, then when you throw everybody's hat in the ring, <laughs> that you are mutually accountable, doesn't that change the nature of it? And we all have to agree. Hello. We all do. We don't want to take too much more time, but that's what we do with our prophetic teams. You know, if they're in our church 16 or 17 years, if we're a team, say us three, and you feel a word that's maybe one of those, we teach our people to check with the team. So you don't just blurt out and the, and the guy or girl's going, I don't even like them, you know. And, right? You're, you're caught off guard. So, and, and, and Braden, you and I know that because of the so many mistakes in the past, we just feel the Holy Spirit wants to give a different wisdom how it should function. Not controlling, but just maybe this is a better way. Let it be judged by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let's be accountable for our words. I mean, we had in our church, individuals would go in the back with a girl. We don't even know what was being said. Would you view that as right or wrong? Doesn't, the, doesn't Scripture say, let the prophets, let the others judge what's being said? Isn't that what we were reading? I would call that out of order. And so would our church, biblically as we understand it. No accountability. What was said, I ain't telling you guys. You're not telling the rest of us what's going on? 
You, you know what I mean? So there's been lots of mistakes made that we want to try to bring a healthy accountability and balance. And yet the Holy Spirit is God. And he may use a corrective word to speak to somebody that just broke them through. Right? So we're just giving some ground rules that can be healthy for the family to grow up so that those people don't get hurt in the midst of these types of words. Like I shared, I think the first session, being at a church here in Abbotsford and standing in the back with a bunch of young prophetic people that were saved about six weeks and one of them prophesying, oh, you, you need to move to Saudi Arabia. And I'm like, what? Really, you think I should? I mean, I quit my job, you know. That should be discerned. Do you think that should be discerned? That's a good word to be discerned, right? So we're, we're talking about levels of accountability that can be healthy without controlling the family. But I believe there are some biblical foundations that are really good for us to consider together. And what Tinny shared, did you see what was on there? What was the 50% growth one? Discussion. Discussion. Let's, let's, let's look at it here. Let's open a discussion and keep our hearts open to be teachable so that, that we're not setting everything. And our pastor Daniel in our church said something to me 20 years ago. I'm learning. When he said that to me, it just went right in my being. And I thought, man, my older fathers are learning. I better be, I'm learning. We're learning together so that we can present the Lord in a more pure way, not just to the church family, but to the world. So that they're not laughing and posting you on YouTube that you prophesied something that never came to pass 20 times in a row. Right? We don't want to be mocked and laughed at. We want the Holy Spirit to give us such a clarity and a corporateness that when he says it, the world goes, that's God. That's God, right? And that's what we believe is happening. He is after the church family to make us one in a new way so that his name will not be mocked, that we will speak and prophesy things that come to pass. Amen? Let's stand up. Pastor Ken. Can you, you help us uh, divide into some groups here, or however you want to lead us? All right. Thanks, John and Brad. So if you know of the team you're with, just start going there right now, okay? Uh, David, were you going to be coming up with John I mentioned? Um, um, who did I say you were going to be with? Was it? John. So John and, and, and um, Josiah. Okay, Steve, you guys got the team. Okay, so the twins. What I'd like you to do, if you could, if one of the twins could come in the front with Brad and Penny. Okay, Nick or Greg, just one of you come on up here to the front as well, because I think there's going to be a few. We're going to need four, four people. Okay, who is not in a team? Just put up your hand. Okay, so Shelly and Deb and... Um, Okay, if you three could come together and you could jo join them over there. Could you do that? Then I think we got everybody but Johannes. And you, no, Johannes, could you come over here? Come on over here. With, do you mind separating Braden and Elizabeth? Are you okay with that? Okay. So, Johannes, if I could get Lynn, Johannes, and Elizabeth. And if you guys could be a team. And then the three of us will come together if we're okay with that. Okay, are we all taken care of? Good. Okay, so you're going to give direction. So what we're going to do is Pastor Ken is going to direct you to one of the teams for prayer. For the teams, let's remember edification, exhortation, comfort. If God goes outside of the box, check with Pastor Ken. <laughs> right? And he might. We're not, we're not tell the Holy Spirit exactly what to do. But also ask the Holy Spirit to let you feel the team. You know, that we would flow together what he wants to say. Amen? Is that okay? Is that clear? Okay. All right. So you may be seated. Okay, and, and t take a seat there where you're at. All right. Praise the Lord. You're going to call people for prayer. Oh, okay. I'm not, 
I'm not quite understanding. We call people old. Okay, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. So in your setting, how long are we going to go, John? You know, 12 minutes and we'll mix up. Let's do about 12 minutes. Introduce yourself to one another, because I think there's new people probably in your group. Okay. And then just ask one another if there's areas of prayer that they need. Okay. And also if you have a prophetic inclination in your heart. Just the simple gift of prophecy that Brad talked about, um, exhortation, comfort, and edification, okay? And, uh, and so let's begin that way. Just a simple, just a simple entry level. Introduce yourself to one another, okay? And ask in the room if there's anything that they need prayer for, okay? All right? And then begin to pray as the Holy Spirit leads you. And if you begin a prophetic prompting, you go ahead and say that I would like to release something, okay? Do you get it? Do we all understand? All right. Simple and safe. Safe environment. Okay. Just try to abide by some of the guidelines and boundaries that Brad and that John gave. Okay. We'll call you back into order in 12 minutes.
Hi, everyone. Have a good night. Yep, I think the on on site everyone is uh, just in prayer groups now. So if you've finished praying or have received prayer, be Cleansing. Testing. Thank you, uh, Church of Zion team and uh, Transform team and all of you online. Thank you so much. So be released. We're just going to have uh, some final, uh, a few final thoughts. You. How are you doing, Elizabeth? <laughs> <laughs> Give that lady a fan here. Come on. <laughs> you, have, you have your biggest fan. That's Braden, right after the Lord. How, how was your prayer time together? How was your prayer time? Yeah? Could you, could you feel like a kind of a corporate feeling with the others you're praying? Anybody? Was there a theme that, that, you know, if you were praying for one, was there a theme the Lord focused on? So there was a theme? It was sort of a similar theme? That's what we're talking about. Like often the Holy Spirit will, will have a theme or it'll be a, a similar contact, content within the team. You know, sometimes he'll jump out of that box and change it, but often there's a theme or a similar context. David, how was prayer for you? Come on up here. How, how was prayer for you, David? It was good. It was spot on. Uh, so like the word that uh, the Lord, uh, totally blanking on your name right now, John. There we go. That was the Lord. <laughs> so no, the word, the word that uh, the Lord gave John uh, for me was like, um, um, was going into a new season and like leaving, leaving the old season behind and stuff like that and like how I want to go back and grab that old season but he's like no, 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 like I need to focus on the season ahead and like sometimes it's going to be people just walking alongside me and sometimes it's going to be like the Lord leading me and so that was so spot on because like, I mean like I've shared this with Aaron so many times, can't remember how many times but I feel like the Lord is leading me into a new season and I don't know what that is but I know like within the last six to eight months, he's changed my life drastically. And I've left so many things behind because I was, you know, once living in the world and living in Jesus. But now I'm just like, no, I, I'm just going fully on Jesus. Like that's it. So, yeah. Good stuff. Bless you, David. Anybody else have a quick testimony? What happened in your, in your little group there? Come on up here. Let's sit there. Uh, so I'm Aaron, everyone. Um, so yeah, like I was just shared a kind of prayer request about how just um, um, there's like some uncertainty in like where I'm going to be working soon because I don't have a job at the moment. And like I just said no to a job. <laughs> and so, yeah, it was just like the uncertainty thing was just like met. It came up against the peace of God. And yeah, I just was kind of got filled with peace again and and even like what um what Brad said was so special where he's like um wow like okay there's a lot to unpack there but he's like before you even need a job you need peace about even looking for a job or even a peace without a job and it's just like huh that made sense on many levels <laughs> and and yeah and then um yeah, that's kind of what happened. And then like Penny obviously had like a complimenting um, like picture that the Lord showed her. And it was just like the theme of kind of, yeah, like just like peace in every stage of the goal that I had. Um, and then Nick's prayer request was like on a similar theme to mine. So it's, it was like the same kind of theme flavor. That's really good. Amen. Thank you, Aaron. Um, you know, uh, we talked about the love of God being that which moves us. And I've found that 
you know, as I, you know, over time too, you grow in your gift and in the love. But one thing I've found is in more recent years, like if I look around this room, I can feel something for many of you. As we draw close to the Father, you start to feel his heart. So we were on a Zoom call not too long ago and I was just looking at the screen, 25 people on my screen, and my heart kept going to this one girl in the top right. And I, I jumped in the meeting and I said, I have a word for you. And it turns out she was gonna uh, just drop off the call because in a breakout room, someone said something that hurt her and she was gonna drop the call and go cry. But the Holy Spirit, the Father's heart, like it's just like my whole being went to her. And she just was weeping online, you know, and we were with our team and there was quite a few people. But I started to realize more and more how the Father's heart will go to people. He is so compassionate. He is so full of love. And, you know, I'm finding more and more you know, as I, just in many settings, many settings and places, but the Father wants to enlarge this family in a love like you've not yet known. And that's for all of us, right? There's levels and layers of the love of God that he's taking the church into. So I want that to be our final prayer and thought tonight, that ask the Holy Spirit, enlarge my heart with a love like I've never known. That when I look at someone, I see your heart. I feel how you feel towards them and give us a clarity. Because I personally believe that what's coming to the church is a baptism of love that the world is gonna know we're his disciples. Isn't that true of John 13, the whole context in the end there? that the world will know through our love because there's something in the heart of man like Ecclesiastes talks about that there's eternity in their heart even when they don't know him they're looking for something but I believe the depth of what they're looking for is to be loved that's the number one thing I believe that is in the depth of a man's or woman's being is to be loved that's why there's so many orphans in the world so I just want to pray this final prayer father baptize this church this family in a love like they've never known for all of us and i pray that there's a a deep place between our church family zion and transform that you want to take us places for the sake of the province and beyond you're lining some things holy spirit and getting us ready for what's coming so i pray right now let that love enlarge our heart. Just flow right now into the room, Lord. And again, to the Zion family, thank you so much for helping and serving. May that same love just flow into the Zion team that was helping tonight. Let us be good stewards of the word that was spoken to each of us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. 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 Zion team, can you unmute and just bring a greeting? Hi. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. So wonderful to be with you. Oh. Hi everyone. Love you all. Love you all. We love Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 So Canada Day is next. We're not going to meet, but on July 8th, we're going to bring a lot of those folks here and we'll have a good, good night together. Amen. Bless you all.